Thank you. <laughs> Welcome back after the lunch break. I hope you had a good meal and you are ready for some more talks for today. So tell me, who is next? We have a guest from outside the NEOS universe. His name is Tenshihara. He is professor at the University of Cooperative Education here in, Dres in Dresden. And he's CEO at Blue Pumpkin. And um, he is going to talk a bit about microservices. So from outside the NEOS perspective, a broad view onto microsystems, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Give Have it fun up. and give it to Tenchihara. Yeah, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I don't know what to say. I hope I can entertain you a little bit. The slides were completed this morning. So the panic monkey came out just in time. And let's see. Sebastian told me about 45 minutes. I hope I can stretch it to half an hour or so. If I'm still here in an hour, please drag me off the stage. <laughs> OK, so micro systems. Um, I'm pretty sure you all know what microservice-based systems are, but just to get everybody on the same side here, you know, traditionally, when we look at a monolith system, we have a single stone, and often there is a server running many applications, and you have a lot of components within those applications, and of course, it's hard to maintain such a system. So even if you break this down to only one application running on the server, you still have many components that are dependent on each other. And basically, it's a nightmare to manage all of this. So how can we improve on this situation? Well, let's go away from a client and say we talk about a user. And the user wants to use a service. Then, of course, a service can comprise of many applications. And taking a step back, of course, you could say, well, if I have this view on the system, then what about making everything comprise of only services? Thus, we have many small services that build together our application we want to use. So this basically is a microservice, but you all knew that already. So we have many excellent concepts in theory, but we know the practice might be a bit different here. So we have practical implementations. Some of them are very limited. Some are very complex. Some require some tuning here. Some require some tweaking over here. And what we often see is a divergence between the architectural design of our system and the actual distribution of our components. So why this talk? Basically, we have a cycle we always find. We have some ideas in academia. We transfer these into the industry, so to you guys. Then you have some best practices, and these, via your research and development, comes back to us via academic studies. So of course, this is a cycle. And I have a feeling we are in a point of time now where these micro-based services, micro front ends, and so on should be closer investigated in academia again. So this talk, the good, the bad, and the ugly, what are we going to have a look at? So just imagine the situation, of course, you want to be a software developer, of course. And why do you want to be assigned to our office in Mexico? Because I want to be a senior developer. And being a senior developer, I know there is always a bueno, a feo, and a malo. So, como estáis? Everybody great? 
Let's have a look. Let's start with El Bueno, the good. So basically, we can have a composition of our microservices, build our system, and you all know we can either go the way through orchestration or we can go through choreography. However, we could also imagine some hybrid approaches, which I would like to call a musical. So we have aspects of orchestration, we have aspects of choreography. Of course, both with their pros and cons, with the overhead and communication, with our organizational challenges we have to address. So one of the greatest challenges, I think, as basic as it sounds, is finding our microservices. So we have two approaches here, the client side service discovery. So basically, if our user wants to use a web shop, for example, the shop system might ask a service registry, where are these microservices? Of course, in the first step, these microservices need to register at the service registry. So as soon as the lookup takes place, the shop knows where to forward the request. I think that's pretty easy. However, there might be a component that says, well, I'm not in the mood today. Please have a look somewhere else. And then our shop system needs to forward the request to somewhere else. So basically, the client is also a microservice from this perspective. And it has to join everything together. Can we do this differently? Of course. Rather than client-side service discovery, we could say we do server-side client, uh, server-side service discovery. So what does that mean? Our user, once again, asks a microservice. We call it gatekeeper now. I want to use the services. And rather than having all these requests handled through the client, the gatekeeper handles all requests that follow, independent of how big the systems become. So if we have a rewards program there, we have components like user profile. They know where they are to each other, and they can communicate. And you are all aware, I think, you can also always embed some external, for example, payment provider. So this is basically what we would expect from a web shop. This is how we want our system to behave. So in the end effect, our gatekeeper is always a very special microservice that's there to look up the other microservices and handle all communication that follows. And of course, this is also true if you have multiple instances of your microservices. That, of course, is great. So what do we get from a system that we design in this fashion. Basically, a few freebies. You get, of course, separation of concerns. That's always great. On the other hand, you also receive flexibility. So how do you deploy your components? It's flexible. Which technology do you use? Well, it's flexible. You could also scale, as we have seen, individually, or you could also scale overall for the application. There are many customers, just start another shop instance. Or you could also downscale again. The customers are gone. The orders have been processed. Well, we shut down some instances. And of course, onboarding, like business to business connectivity, great stuff. And of course, as I said, freebies. Well, technically, not really free, but you get the gist, I think. So that's nice. Now I'm going to hurt you. Let's talk about the bad. So we might have some deployment complexity, which we need to address here. So taking away all these communication aspects, let's just don't care about them. Let's just have a look at our components. Well, then we have the shop. And how do we achieve this auto scaling? Are we running, for example, on Amazon Web Services? How can we check the token validity if these components are just mixed together? We are all lazy, I think, so lots of copy-paste. There are some components that work. Great. I just used them for my system. Somebody else has tested it. Is that a good idea? Well. What kind of token do we get? Is it an access control list? Is it a capability? 
Well, if you don't read the README and the documentation, you don't know. So you need to follow up on whatever you're using here. Well, now we have payment providers. There might be some regional restrictions, right? Are you able to pay in euros everywhere? Or maybe in US dollars or Russian rubles? Hmm, okay. We found a payment provider who is able to process payments in different currencies. That's great. But now they changed their API. Do we need to update our system now? Probably, at least this component. Maybe somebody else can take care of it. Well, now we have all these microservices there. Of course, we have this discoverability aspect, finding these microservices, but what about security? Whatever code you're using, which you have not written yourself, might pose a security risk. We have this situation in Ukraine, sadly, and many maintainers have introduced code that says stuff like Slava Ukraine. So maybe you're running your web shop and a customer is searching for something. I want a new screen. And it says, this great screen, Slava Ukraine. Hmm. Maybe you should have had a look at the code. Well, and finally, we have this gatekeeper over there. And as you can see, I am imagining the gatekeeper itself to scale up and down by introducing several instances. However, how do you address the gatekeeper? Are you using a floating IP? Or do you let DNS take care of this? Well, independent of what you're using, how do we handle sticky sessions? Imagine a customer running our web shop comes back later. If the session is not sticky, they have a problem. OK, these are just some ideas I want to throw at you. Let's continue. So we have all these components running somewhere as a microservice, let's say within a network, maybe with a fancy firewall. Great, security problem eliminated. Yeah? Well, is such a connection actually still allowed then? This external payment provider is not part of our network. And how does this network actually look like? Is it a software-defined network? Is it an actual physical network? And if it's a network that's somewhere in the world, we are relying on Amazon Web Services, for example, how can we be sure that we are accessing the proper network? Do we use something like a virtual private network? Or do we have to rely on queue and queue tagging for our system? And if so, who is in control of the entire system? I hope we are in control. But you never know as soon as you give it out of your hands. OK, so maybe this is a bad idea. Let's split up the system, and we say we're going to use several networks. So it's not just one network that might fail. We have different providers, each with their specialties. Then we find our components, of course. But how do we organize communication between these networks? I would say this can't be better than what we've seen before. OK, let's try to bring some order into these ideas and these problems I just addressed. I think we are all aware of the traditional way to design a system. You just introduce a three-tier model, and you say you have the users on one side, you have the gatekeeper in the middle, and independent of the physical deployment, the third tier are all these services you're using. Sounds good, right? Well, are you actually able to deploy it like that? Maybe yes, maybe no. Does service discovery still work in a system on a logical level designed like this? Well, and if we have our external service provider over there in tier three, isn't that a breach of trust? I don't know. 
We can discuss about that later. Do we really have a separation of concerns when all other microservices there depend on an access token generated by our user profile microservice? I think this service can block all other services. There must be a, a better approach to this, or maybe not. So, okay, this was very hypothetical. Let's see what happens if we deploy this into the real world. So maybe we don't have so much money, we choose the cheap solution, so we have our nice network and we have a few physical machines on which we deploy our microservices. Looks great, right? We even have some resources still available for scaling later, so design, everything's good. Our system can react. If there is a load peak, we can start another instance right in there. Great. So let's say our shop gets overloaded. No problem, right? We just start another instance. That's great. However, you all know that's one physical machine up there. And if there's a process hanging like that, what normally happens? Of course, it affects the other services as well, and they crash. And once that machine's gone, our entire system is gone. So good luck with that. That's bad. We need to find a better solution. Well, the solution is overhead, right? You just have more resources than you actually need, but then you also pay more. And the larger the system becomes, the larger the deployment complexity. Maybe you lose sight of the architecture. It's too complex. How do you discover services? If you have multiple instances of those services, how do you find the proper instance for your current customer, for example? And let's not talk about costs. Of course, the more resources you have, the better, but money is a finite resource. So you have IT resources and money resources. You need to bring these together. And who would have thought sometimes you don't have real separation of concerns, as seen earlier, and how, for example, do you revoke a token? You have this user profile service, it generates a token, and now this user is malicious, or they delete their account, somebody steals their, I don't know, JWT, for example. You need a way to revoke tokens. Normally, this doesn't work with Redis or sticky sessions and so on, so that's not so good. Okay. We had a look at some problems that might occur so Robin finds, of course, the evidence, and we know what we have to do. However, if you have a closer look at that, these bad aspects bring us to the ugly aspects, of course. So let's talk about the ugly. In, particularly, in particular, let's talk about front ends. So, there might be an anti-pattern, which I, of course, observe many times. You have a nice deployment of microservices, and then you have a nice microservice front end that binds everything together, so our web shop runs. But if you have a closer look, of course, this microservice is the monolith once again, because it can block the entire system. So the better idea would be to spread your front end over all microservices. And if you have a closer look even at that, you would say, OK, now I have a nice front end spread over all microservices. There is no blocking monolith. Well, there still is, right? We have customers in our web shop. And where is customer data stored? In a database. So once again, we have a monolith there. So what do you do? Of course. The solution is simple, right? You introduce another microservice, and everything's peachy now, right? Sounds great. Problem solved. 
is this really a good idea to proceed like this? I see some guys shaking their heads. Of course, not with web technologies. So, micro front ends. Looks good, right? Independently deployable, communication, top. We even have stateful communication, it's important, especially if everything is REST-based. It's independent of the technology. All checkboxes ticked, right? Well, actually, it's a bad idea. The fundamental tool to integrate such a micro front end is shell loading. And shell loading is not bad, it's even ugly. So no matter which microservice you address first, they will take care of this customer request, and the rest of the GUI is shell-loaded by this microservice to which you have communicated first. So what actually happens is you have a customer accessing your web shop, and they bring together all aspects of the front end. So what I often see is something like this. We have our shell in the browser, we have our components, and everything is brought together with a whole bunch of iframes. So we have an iframe maybe for the offer of the day. We have an iframe which shows what other customers have bought. You have an iframe for your personal shopping cart. Maybe there's another iframe in the bottom right. Talk to a customer representative now or chat with them or whatever. So everything's brought together through JavaScript, of course. Well, remember we've talked about external payment providers earlier. Maybe you have also other aspects that are external. And you all know where this leads to cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery. So from a security perspective, this is a very bad idea. Well, but the customer might say, hey, I want to use PayPal or whatever. You need to support this stuff. Well, that seems to be difficult. Let's go back a few slides. Remember when we talked about deployment complexity, we had all these questions arising. Let's break this down to another aspect. Let's not talk about external payment providers. Let's go a step further. Let's make it ugly. We shall use an external credentials provider. OK. Let's even break this down to the core. That's important for us. With our gatekeeper, so our customer talks to the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper looks up all these microservices. There's this user profile microservice. And the user profile microservice gets your token from an external credentials provider. OK, system runs. Great. Well, not so good, right? The external provider says, I revoke this user's token. Well, that's no problem, right? Our user profile says, OK, I won't accept their credentials any longer. So be gone, right? Well, the customer still wants their data. So this is exactly the, situ the situation we have now, for example, with customers in Russia. They might get locked out because some credentials provider decides all Russians are evil. Does that mean they are not allowed, even they are, I don't know, Europeans, to access their data stored in a European web shop? I would say no, right? It's not their fault that there is a provider somewhere in Russia. It's their data. You cannot steal their data. You cannot lock them out from their data. We have very strong privacy laws in Europe, so people have a right to access their data. They have a right to have their data deleted. They have a right to have their data corrected. This all doesn't work if they cannot lock in 
because some external provider decided that their access is revoked. So basically, this revocation needs to be done on that level, not on this level. OK. That's one problem. Let's talk about business-to-business -business site loading. So we have a nice shop, of course. And let's be more specific. It's a clothing shop. And this clothing shop also offers socks and shoes from external shops, of course. This is great for the customer, right? I only need to provide my payment information, like credit card details, to this one shop, and the shop will take care of the rest. Great. This is very customer friendly. But it's not friendly for our business partners. They need to trust that they will receive their money after the payment has been processed. They also need to trust your shop that the user has been validated properly. Basically, this means they hope you issued the token yourself and not one of these faulty Heroku or Travis CI tokens issued by GitHub, right? If so, shit is going to hit the fan. OK, let's take an even closer, even closer look now and go down really to the access level. As I mentioned earlier, often these kind of systems are built based on a REST interface, so let's do some RESTing. So I hope you've all heard of HTTP parameter pollution. So what happens if you use a REST interface with GET requests? So we have a parameter P1, and we are just invoking P1 twice. What's better, Star Trek or Star Wars? Oh, don't answer. Your answer is wrong, definitely. Yeah? If you say Star Wars, the Trekkies will kill you. If you, if you say Star Trek, I don't know, Lord Vader will come in. So which value of P1 will you take? You don't know. Your microservice system is technology independent. This is what we wanted. Well, Tomcat uses only the first occurrence of P1. HTTPD and Nginx only use the last occurrence of our parameter. And Dready Microsoft uses a concatenation of both. Well, that's a very handy vector for us, right? So let's check. Yahoo, Star Wars. Ecosia, Star Wars. Google, Star Trek Star Wars. I guess somebody's running Microsoft stuff. <laughs> so the root of the problem we are having here is that there is no standard, and there's also no RFC that defines how you have to process parameters. So our nice technology independence is gone. And let's take this a step further. Let's use this vector. So we have our web shop, and we might ask the customers, how is our web shop? Or for you guys today at the end, you will be asked to rate my talk, right? So let's use Facebook. So we have a URL like this, Shara PHP. Well, we can have cat as a service, and we put a quote there, something like that. So we have two parameters. One is the title of our shared link, and one is the URL of the shared link. And I think you all see the problem here. We have a plain text ampersand over there. Well, we can use this, right? So there we have our Facebook site. And we have some issues with PowerPoint, but that's OK. So this box, imagine it's there. Okay, We escape our ampersand over there. We are using this evil root. And we just attach another U parameter here. So basically, we overwrite cat as a service by appending the URL with our new fancy URL we want to use. And of course, this leads to Facebook sharing our like under the wrong URL. Easy peasy, right? 
Fucking hell, right? So, can academia help? Well, microservices are nothing but a fancy distributed system. So, probably the answer is yes. Microservices need some understanding of common time. This is important for revocation of security tokens. And that's what we have traditionally the Lampert approach for. That's great for debugging. However, remember, we are operating a web shop. The customer wants to order now, not after you are done with debugging. OK, let's assume we solve this problem somehow. Then we always have our problem with the cap theorem. You know, you cannot have consistency, availability, and partition tolerance at the same time. You can only have two of these three aspects at any time. Yeah, well, that's what eventual consistency is there for, right? You all know this. You look at some YouTube videos. Congratulations, you are viewer number 117. And somewhere in the United States, somebody else, congratulations, you are viewer 117. And maybe half an hour later, YouTube will say 118 people have had a look at this video. That's eventual consistency, right? So basically, yes. Eventual consistency is great to address our problems with the cap theorem. However, the customer wants to order now. Well, let's use NoSQL databases. Well, we have the base principle here. Well, basically, available, soft state, eventual consistency. Great. That's a nice one. I like it because our customer wants to order now. And it's a limited item. There's only one of them. If it's gone, it's gone. And now, don't get me started on blockchain, OK? So what's the short answer for can academia help? Maybe, right? I'm not sure. So there are many aspects which could lead to solutions. Let us discuss. Thank you very much. So thank you very much thank for you. this talk. Well, are you Star Wars or Star Trek? <laughs> <laughs> I know there is no right answer. In, in the States, one would say, I pull a fifth. <laughs> so I'll take use or make use of my Fifth Amendment right, and I refuse to answer. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Granted. <laughs> well, um, do we have any questions from the audience yet? Actually, no. Well, I think we just had lunch, and you're still a bit um, digesting at the moment. <laughs> but um, we have a little present for you. Sure. Would you want to? I fetch it. Uh, that is actually a, f a speaker present, a little bottle of gin. Thank you very much. For you. Thank you. So, thank you for being here. Um, You're very welcome. Give a big applause to Tenchi Haga. Thanks for having me.